So I wanted to do a quick video on UTIs in pregnancy because of the connotations that it carries on the pregnancy itself. Grab a piece of paper and let's go. Hello and welcome to MK's Medical Review Series. My name is Dr. Moses Kazevu. This is a series on my YouTube channel where we look at medical topics in depth. Today we're going to look at UTIs in pregnancy. If you haven't yet subscribed to the channel, please hit the subscribe button, hit the bell notification icon to be receiving notifications every time I post. Drop a comment, drop a like to show some support, grab a piece of paper, and let's go. So remember that urinary tract infections in pregnancy are very common. And they can affect either the lower urinary tract, which is pretty much going to be including the bladder and the urethra. So infection of the bladder is referred to as the cystitis, while this infection of the urethra is referred to as the urethritis, although urethritis is discussed in another chapter. Or these urinary tract infections can affect the upper tract, that's including the kidneys, what we refer to as pyelonephritis. Remember that in pregnancy, you naturally have this hydronephrosis, reason being you're going to be having the pregnant uterus actually growing and can actually compress on the right lower ureter. And also, as the pregnancy goes further and further on, it produces progesterone. And progesterone has a relaxation, causes relaxation of smooth muscles. So this can actually decrease the tone of the ureters. So both these factors are going to be resulting in stasis of urine. And there's also an increase in vesicoureteral reflux, which can actually lead to symptomatic upper urinary tract infections. Remember that the hydronephrosis that we see in pregnancy is going to be manifested by dilatation of the renal pelvis, the calluses, the ureters, and this is greater with the right kidney than with the left. 80% of women actually have asymptomatic bacteriuria, and if it's actually left untreated, it may progress to pyelonephritis, it may become symptomatic and complicate to things like low birth weight as well as preterm delivery. The commonest organisms that we often see are pretty much going to be attributed to Escherichia coli. Over 70% of the cases are due to this, but less common pathogens include Streptococci, Proteus, Pseudomonas, Enterobacter, Staphylococcus aureus, and Klebsiella species. Remember that many laboratories have different definitions of what they actually refer to as a UTI, but one such definition is greater than 10 to the power of 5 colony forming units per mil of urine but it can also be defined as greater than 100 colony forming units per mil with pyuria that's greater than 7 white blood cells per mil if they are asymptomatic. Because of the connotations that UTIs have on pregnancy, we often tend to screen patients at the first prenatal visit and this is, has been recommended from a very long time ago. The reason why we get UTIs common in females than in men is because one reason, they have a shorter urethra in females, about 4 centimeters. The close proximity of the external urethromeatus actually to the areas which are contaminated heavily with bacteria such as the vulva in the lower third of the vagina and also catheterization in certain sexual practices such as sexual intercourse because it may actually introduce this bacteria into this area. Predisposing factors of urinary tract infections include pregnancy, we've already discussed how it's a risk factor, history of recurrent cystitis, Renal tract abnormalities such as a duplex system, scarred kidneys, ureteric damage and stones, diabetes, bladder emptying problems such as multiple sclerosis and sequel cell trait. Clinical features are going to be different in pregnancy and occasionally may present like lower back pain, but of course this is also similar to labor. And general malaise with flu-like symptoms. The classic symptoms that we see of UTIs of frequency, dysuria and hematuria are not often seen in pregnancy. And on examination, you may find there may be tachycardia, pyrexia, dehydration, and loin tenderness. Investigations include a midstream urine. This should be a clean catch. For microscopic culture sensitivity, it's best taken in the morning and a full blood count. Management is going to be including doses of antibiotics, should, which should be started straight away. Encourage the woman to take plenty of fluids. And of course, simple analgesics such as paracetamol can be used. That was just merely an overview of UTAs, but we'll talk about specifics just shortly. There is prophylaxis such as we offer to patients that have UTAs to prevent future UTAs. 
often they take prophylaxis of nitrofurantoin 100 mg once a day usually at night until two weeks postnatal. Indications include acute cystitis, pyelonephritis, recurrent or persistent asymptomatic bacteriuria. Let's first start talk about asymptomatic bacteriuria. Asymptomatic meaning that there are no symptoms, bacteriuria meaning that they have some bacteria in the urine. So this is actually the most common UTI in pregnancy. So this is actually defined as having 10 to the power of 5 colony forming units in midstream clean catch specimen of urine on two occasions without any symptoms of urinary tract infection. Remember that this is going to be an indication that there is actively multiplying bacteria in the urinary tract and most of the cases are going to be attributed to Escherichia coli. Other pathogens include Klebsiella pneumoniae as well as Proteus. Now because patients may actually have pre-existing asymptomatic bacteriuria, all pregnant women ideally should be screened for this at the first antenatal visit, so you should get a urine culture. 25% of these women that have asymptomatic bacteriuria if left untreated will progress to pyelonephritis in the third trimester. And remember, asymptomatic bacteriuria increases the incidence of hypertension, anemia, premature labor, and growth retardation. Remember, there are no clinical symptoms, no features, but if it's left untreated, may develop in, into acute pyelonephritis. Diagnosis is made by a positive urine culture that's a clean catch midstream urine sample showing more than five, 10 to the power 5 forming units of a single organism without any symptoms of a UTI. Then you will refer to that as asymptomatic bacteriuria. Management includes giving antibiotics that you're going to be giving for 10 to 14 days. Some, com some co antibiotics that you can use include a combination of amoxicillin and clavulonic acid, 875 milligrams twice a day orally, amoxicillin 500 milligrams three times a day, cephalexin 500 milligrams three times a day, nitrofurantoin 100 milligrams twice a day. A single dose of nitrofurantoin, train, 0.2 grams, or amoxicillin, 3 grams, can actually be given and has actually been found to be effective. Prophylaxis with nitrofurantoin as well as amoxicillin at night can actually be continued until delivery when the infection is recurrent. And women who have recurrent UTI should ideally undergo imaging of the upper urinary tract three months postpartum. We move on now to acute cystitis which is affecting the bladder. So this is where the UTI is localized to the bladder without any systemic findings. Clinical features include urgency, frequency, burning sensation on urination, as well as suprapubic pain. It also has the propensity to actually progress to acute pyelonephritis. And remember that the diagnosis, just like with the other types of UTIs, you have a clean catch midstream urine sample showing greater than 10 to the power of five colony forming units per mil of urine of a single organism. Treatment is going to be including a single agent and can actually be treated as an outpatient. Nitrofurantoin is a good start, 100 mg twice a day. Orally for 7 days, second choice of antibiotics could be cefuroxim or cephalexin, which can be given 500 mg 3 times a day orally. Ideally, you should check for a urine culture and sensitivity if it's available and adjust the antibiotics accordingly, especially if the first line treatment fails. If the UTA is actually recurrent, Recheck your urine cultures and sensitivities and adjust your antibiotics. Avoid nitrofurantoin at term because this it may produce neonatal hemolysis as a side effect. Now we'll talk about pyelonephritis. Remember that here you have a UTI that's affecting the upper urinary tract and you have the systemic findings. So this is actually one of the most serious medical complications of pregnancy and it's often unilateral and affects the right side because I already explained the anatomy of how the uterus actually compresses on the ureters on the right side in about 70 to 80 percent of the cases. Only about 10 to 15 percent of the cases is the left side affected and only a few cases do we have it affecting both kidneys. Escherichia coli is mostly cultured in 80 percent of the times and bacteremia is seen in 15 to 20 percent of women with acute pyelonephritis. It is much more common in prim gravidus than it is in multiparous women. Now remember that you have this dilatation of the ureters and the renal pelvis. You may have a stasis of urine in the bladder and the ureters. And this is a normal physiological change that happens in pregnancy. This can actually predispose them to organisms colonizing this urine that has become static. Organisms including E. coli in 70% of the cases, Klebsiella pneumonia in 10% of the cases, Enterobacter, Proteus, Pseudomonas, and Staphylococcus aureus. Clinical features depend largely on the mode of onset 
and the presenting features can be classified as acute or severe and chronic. In the acute infection, this usually appears beyond the 16th week of pregnancy. It may be bilateral, but if it's unilateral, it's much more common on the right. Remember that the clinical features are as a result of endotoxemia. So this is going to lead to chemical mediators being formed such as interleukin-1, 6, 8, and tumor necrosis factor alpha. So there will be an acute aching pain over the loins that's often radiating to the groin. Renal angle tenderness, that's the coastal vertebral angle tenderness. Some urinary symptoms such as urgency, frequency, dysuria, and hematuria. Systemic symptoms of a fever with chills and rigors followed by hypothermia. Anorexia, nausea, vomiting, and myalgias. Respiratory distress and pulmonary edema, that's the acute respiratory distress syndrome, can be due to endotoxins actually causing alveolar-induced injury. Diagnosis is going to be through positive urine cultures. Again, a clean catch sample that's greater than 10 to the power 5 colony forming units per mil of a single organism. Additional investigations include a full blood count, serum creatinine, urea, electrolytes to assess the renal function, and a cardiotocography to monitor the fetus. Differential diagnosis include placenta abruption, acute appendicitis, preterm labor, chorioamnionitis, acute cholecystitis, infarcted myoma, as well as red degeneration of the fibroid. Remember, chorioamnionitis is now referred to as an intrachorion, intrachorion or infection or intramniotic infection. Management includes admission of the patient, rehydrating them with crystalloids to actually maintain an adequate output. So generally, you want to aim for more than 60 mils per hour. Monitor the vitals, such as the temperature and the blood pressure. Analgesia for the pain and the fever. Paracetamol is a good start, 500 mils. Milligrams, rather, which you can give orally. And IV antibiotics should include cephalosporins or aminoglycosides, such as gentamicin. And you should note that the most common cause of persistent pyelonephritis, despite you giving them adequate treatment, is actually nephrolithiasis, so renal stones. You must actually screen them for renal stones. Get them an ultrasound. Ceftriaxone so 1 gram BDIV can be given every 24 hours. If you don't have that, benzoyl penicillins, 5 mega units IV stat, then this is followed by 2.5 mega units IV. This is QID four times a day. Then gentamicin is given at 5 milligrams per kg every 24 hours. Cefazolin can actually be used as an alternative, and we should check our urine cultures and sensitivities prior to starting antibiotics ideally, and then adjust them according to the response, according to the results. If the patient doesn't have a clinical response after 72 hours, reevaluate the results and reevaluate the antibiotic coverage. If you do not have abilities to check your sensitivity, then you continue the antibiotics until they are afebrile for 48 hours. You ideally should change to cephalosporins if there is no clinical response within 72 hours. And once they are afebrile, you can actually switch them to oral antibiotics that will take for a total of 14 days. We repeat the cultures after two weeks of antibiotics and then repeat them at each trimester of pregnancy. If the symptoms actually recur or the dipstick tests become positive, they show nitrites and leukocyte esterase then a urine culture can be done and repeated. If it comes out positive, this woman needs to be retreated. Antibiotic suppression actually after the therapy is actually needed and is actually continued till the end of pregnancy to prevent recurrence in about 30 to 40% of the pregnancies. Nitrofurantin is used as 100 milligrams once a day at bedtime has actually been found to be quite effective. Complications of pyelonephritis include maternal complications such as pulmonary edema and acute respiratory distress syndrome endotoxin induced injuries actually causing this to the alveoli then you may have hemolysis and anemia renal dysfunction which may cause an increased creatinine fetal complications such as preterm labor prematurity and dismaturity causing low birth weight abortions and intrauterine fetal death also can be as a result due to hyperpyrexia and low birth weight i really hope you enjoyed this video on utis in pregnancy if you did consider subscribing to the channel until the next time to Zambia and beyond, bye-bye.